In Search of the Miraculous, Chapter 4 G's lectures led to many talks in our groups. There was still a good deal that was not clear to me, but many things had become connected, and one thing often quite unexpectedly explained another which seemed to have no connection with it whatever. Certain parts of the system had already begun vaguely to take shape, like figures or a landscape which gradually appears in the developing of a photographic plate, but many places still remained blank and incomplete. At the same time, many things were contrary to what I expected. Only I tried not to come to conclusions, but wait. Often one new word that I had not heard before altered the whole picture, and I was obliged to rebuild for myself everything I had built up before. I realised very clearly that a great deal of time must pass before I could tell myself that I could outline the whole system correctly. And it was very strange for me to hear how people, after having come to us for one lecture, at once understood what we were talking about, explained it to others and had completely settled and definite opinions about us. I must confess that, at such times, I often recalled my own first meeting with G., and the evening with the Moscow group. I also, at that time, had been very near passing a ready judgment on G and his pupils. But something had stopped me then. And now, when I had begun to realise what a tremendous value these ideas had, I became almost terrified at the thought of how easily I could have passed them by, how easily I could have known nothing whatever of G's existence, or how easily I could have again lost sight of him if I had not asked then whether I could see him again. In almost every one of his lectures, G reverted to a theme which he evidently considered to be of the utmost importance, but which was very difficult for many of us to assimilate. There are, he said, two lines along which man's development proceeds, the line of knowledge and the line of being. In right evolution, the line of knowledge and the line of being develop simultaneously, parallel to and help him one another. But if the line of knowledge gets too far ahead of the line of being, or if the line of being gets ahead of the line of knowledge, man's development goes wrong and sooner or later it must come to a standstill. People understand what knowledge means and they understand the possibility of different levels of knowledge. They understand that knowledge may be lesser or greater, that is to say, of one quality or of another quality. But they do not understand this in relation to being. Being, for them, means simply existence, to which is opposed just non-existence. They do not understand that being or existence may be of very different levels and categories. Take, for instance, the being of a mineral and of a plant. It is a different being. The being of a plant and of an animal is again a different being. The being of an animal and of a man is a different being. But the being of two people can differ from one another more than the being of a mineral and of an animal. This is exactly what people do not understand, and they do not understand that knowledge depends on being. Not only do they not understand this latter, but they definitely do not wish to understand it. And especially in Western culture it is considered that a man may possess great knowledge for example, he may be an able scientist, make discoveries, advance science, and at the same time he may be, and has the right to be, a petty, egoistic, cavilling, mean, envious, vain, naive and absent-minded man. It seems to be considered here that a professor must always forget his umbrella everywhere. And yet it is his being, and people think that his knowledge does not depend on his being. People of Western culture put great value on the level of a man's knowledge, but they do not take value the level of a man's being, and are not ashamed of the low level of their own being. They do not even understand what it means, and they do not understand that a man's knowledge depends on the level of his being. If knowledge gets far ahead of being, it becomes theoretical and abstract and inapplicable to life, or actually harmful, because instead of serving life and helping people the better to struggle with the difficulties they meet, it begins to complicate man's life, brings new difficulties into it, new troubles and calamities which were not there before. 
The reason for this is that knowledge which is not in accordance with being cannot be large enough for or sufficiently suited to man's real needs. It would always be a knowledge of one thing together with ignorance of another thing, a knowledge of the detail without a knowledge of the whole, a knowledge of the form without a knowledge of the essence. Such preponderance of knowledge over being is observed in present-day culture. The idea of the value and importance of the level of being is completely forgotten. And it is forgotten that the level of knowledge is determined by the level of being. Actually, at a given level of being, the possibilities of knowledge are limited and finite. Within the limits of a given being, the quality of knowledge cannot be changed and the accumulation of information of one and the same nature within already known limits alone is possible. A change in the nature of knowledge is possible only with a change in the nature of being. Taken in itself, a man's being has many different sides. The most characteristic feature of a modern man is the absence of unity in him and, further, the absence in him of even traces of those properties which he most likes to ascribe to himself, that is, lucid consciousness, free will, a permanent ego or I, and the ability to do. It may surprise you if I say that the chief feature of a modern man's being, which explains everything else that is lacking in him, is sleep. A modern man lives in sleep. In sleep he is born and in sleep he dies. About sleep, its significance and its role in life, we will speak later. But at present, just one think of one thing. What knowledge can a sleeping man have? And if you think about it, and at the same time remember that sleep is the chief feature of our being, it will at once become clear to you that if a man really wants knowledge, he must first of all think about how to wake, that is, about how to change his being. Exteriorly, man's being has many different sides, activity or passivity, truthfulness or a tendency to lie, sincerity or insincerity, courage, cowardice self-control, plugvacy, irritability, egoism, readiness for self-sacrifice, pride, vanity, conceit, industry, laziness, morality, depravity. All these and much more besides make up the being of man. But all this is entirely mechanical in man. If he lies, it means that he cannot help lying. If he tells the truth, it means that he cannot help telling the truth and so it is with everything. Everything happens. A man can do nothing either in himself or outside himself. But of course there are limits and bounds. Generally speaking, the being of a modern man is of very inferior quality. But it can be of such bad quality that no change is possible. This must always be remembered. People whose being can still be changed are very lucky. But there are people who are definitely diseased, broken machines with whom nothing can be done and such people are in the majority. If you think of this, you will understand why only few can receive real knowledge. Their being prevents it. Generally speaking, the balance between knowledge and being is even more important than a separate development of either one or the other. And a separate development of knowledge or of being is not desirable in any way, although it is precisely this one-sided development that often seems particularly attractive but to people. If knowledge outweighs being, a man knows, but has no power to do. It is useless knowledge. On the other hand, if being outweighs knowledge, a man has the power to do, but does not know. That is, he can do something, but does not know what to do. The being he has acquired becomes aimless, and efforts made to attain it prove to be useless. In the history of humanity, there are known many examples when entire civilizations have perished because knowledge outweighed being or being outweighed knowledge. What are the results of the development of the line of knowledge without being or the development of the line of being without knowledge, someone asked during a talk upon this subject. The development of the line of knowledge without the line of being gives a weak yogi, said G. That is to say, a man who knows a great deal but can do nothing, a man who does not understand. He emphasised these words. 
what he knows, a man without appreciation, that is, a man for whom there is no difference between one kind of knowledge and another. And the development of the line of being without knowledge gives a stupid saint, that is, a man who can do a great deal but who does not know what to do or with what object. And if he does anything, he acts in obedience to his subjective feelings, which may lead him greatly astray and cause him to commit grave mistakes, that is, actually to do the opposite of what he wants. In either case, both the weak yogi and the stupid saint are brought to a standstill. Neither the one nor the other can develop further. In order to understand this, and in general the nature of knowledge and the nature of being, as well as their interrelation, it is necessary to understand the relation of knowledge and being to understanding. Knowledge is one thing, understanding is another thing. People often confuse these concepts and do not clearly grasp what is the difference between them. Knowledge by itself does not give understanding, nor is understanding increased by an increase of knowledge alone. Understanding depends upon the relation of knowledge to being. Understanding is the resultant of knowledge and being, and knowledge and being must not diverge too far, otherwise understanding will prove to be far removed from either. At the same time, the relation of knowledge to being does not change with a mere growth of knowledge. It changes only when being grows simultaneously with knowledge. In other words, understanding grows only with the growth of being. In ordinary thinking, people do not distinguish understanding from knowledge. They think that greater understanding depends on greater knowledge. Therefore, they accumulate knowledge, or that which they call knowledge, but they do not know how to accumulate understanding and do not bother about it. And yet a person accustomed to self-observation knows for certain that at different periods of his life he has understood one and the same idea, one and the same thought, in totally different ways. It often seems strange to him that he could have understood so wrongly that which, in his opinion, he now understands rightly. And he realises, at the same time, that his knowledge has not changed and that he knew as much about the given subject before as he knows now. What, then, has changed? His being has changed, and once his being has changed, understanding must change also. The difference between knowledge and understanding becomes clear when we realise that knowledge may be the function of one centre. Understanding, however, is the function of three centres. Thus, the thinking apparatus may know something but understanding appears only when a man feels and senses what is connected with it. We have spoken earlier about mechanicalness. A man cannot say that he understands the idea of mechanicalness if he only knows about it with his mind. He must feel it with his whole mass, with his whole being. Then he will understand it. In the sphere of practical activity, people know very well the difference between mere knowledge and understanding. They realise that to know and to know how to do are two different things, and that knowing how to do is not created by knowledge alone. But outside the sphere of practical activity, people do not clearly understand what understanding means. As a rule, when people realise that they do not understand a thing, they try to find a name for what they do not understand, and when they find a name they say they understand. But to find a name does not mean to understand. Unfortunately, people are usually satisfied with names. A man who knows a great many names, that is, a great many words, is deemed to understand a great deal. Again, expecting, of course, any sphere of practical activity wherein his ignorance very soon becomes evident. One of the reasons for the divergence between the line of knowledge and the line of being in life and the lack of understanding which is partly the cause and partly the effect of this diversion is to be found in the language which people speak. Their language is full of wrong conceptions, wrong classifications, wrong associations, and the chief thing is that, owing to the essential characteristics of ordinary thinking, that is to say, to its vagueness and inaccuracy, Every word can have thousands of different meanings according to the material the speaker has at his disposal and the complex of associations at work in him at the moment. 
People do not clearly realise to what a degree their language is subjective, that is, what different things each of them says while using the same words. They are not aware that each one of them speaks in a language of his own, understanding other people's language either vaguely or not at all, and having no idea that each one of them speaks in a language unknown to him. People have a very firm conviction or belief that they speak the same language, that they understand one another. Actually, this conviction has no foundation whatever. The language in which they speak is adapted to practical life only. People can communicate to one another information of a practical character, but as soon as they pass to a slightly more complex sphere, they are immediately lost and they cease to understand one another, although they are unconscious of it. People imagine that they often, if not always, understand one another, or that they can, at any rate, understand one another if they try or want to. They imagine that they understand the authors of the books they read, and that other people understand them. This also is one of the illusions which people create for themselves, and in the midst of which they live. As a matter of fact, no one understands anyone else. Two men can say the same thing with profound conviction, but call it by different names, or argue endlessly together without suspecting that they are thinking exactly the same. Or vice versa, two men can say the same words and imagine that they agree with and understand one another, whereas they are actually saying absolutely different things and do not understand one another in the least. If we take the simplest words that occur constantly in speech and endeavour to analyse the meaning given to them, we shall see at once that, at every moment of his life, every man puts into each word a special meaning, which another man can never put into it or suspect. Let us take the word man and imagine a conversation among a group of people in which the word man is often heard. Without any exaggeration, it can be said that the word man will have as many meanings as there are people taking part in the conversation and that these meanings will have nothing in common. In pronouncing the word man, everyone will involuntarily connect with this word the point of view from which he is genuinely accustomed to regard man, or from which, for some reason or other, he regards him at the moment. One man at the moment may be occupied with the question of the relation between the sexes. Then the word man will have no general meaning for him, and on hearing this word he will first of all ask himself, which, man or woman? Another man may be religious and his first question will be a Christian or not a Christian. The third man may be a doctor and the concept man will mean for him a sick man or a healthy man and of course from the point of view of his speciality. A spiritualist will think of man from the point of view of his astral body, of life on the other side and so on and he may say, if he is asked, that men are divided into mediums and non-mediums. A naturalist speaking of man will place the centre of gravity of his thoughts in the idea of man as a zoological type, that is to say, in speaking of man he will think of the structure of his teeth, his fingers, his facial angle, the distance between the eyes. A lawyer will see in man a statistical unit, or a subject for the application of laws, or a potential criminal, or a possible client. A moralist pronouncing the word man will invariably introduce into it the idea of good and evil and so on and so on. People do not notice all these contradictions, do not notice that they never understand one another, that they always speak about different things. It is quite clear that, for proper study, for an exact exchange of thoughts, an exact language is necessary, which would make it possible to establish what a man actually means would include an indication of the point of view from which a given concept is taken and determine the centre of gravity of this concept. The idea is perfectly clear and every branch of science endeavours to elaborate and to establish an exact language for itself. But there is no universal language. People continually confuse the languages of different sciences and can never establish their exact correlation. And even in each separate branch of science, new terminologies, new nomenclatures 
are constantly appearing. And the further it goes, the worse it becomes. Misunderstanding grows and increases instead of diminishing and there is every reason to think that it will continue to increase in the same way and people will understand one another even less and less. For exact understanding, exact language is necessary and the study of systems of ancient knowledge begins with the study of a language which will make it possible to establish at once exactly what is being said, from what point of view and in what connection. This new language contains hardly any new terms or new nomenclature, but it bases the construction of speech upon a new principle, namely the principle of relativity. That is to say, it introduces relativity into all concepts and thus makes possible an accurate determination of the angle of thought for what precisely ordinary language lacks are expressions of relativity. When a man has mastered this language, then, with its help, there can be transmitted and communicated to him a great deal of knowledge and information which cannot be transmitted in ordinary language, even by using all possible scientific and philosophical terms. The fundamental property of the new language is that all ideas in it are concentrated round one idea, that is, they are taken in their mutual relationship from the point of view of one idea. This idea is the idea of evolution. Of course, not evolution in the sense of mechanical evolution, because such an e evolution does not exist, but in the sense of a conscious and volitional evolution, which alone is possible. Everything in the world, from solar systems to man, and from man to atom, either rises or descends, either evolves or degenerates, either develops or decays, but nothing evolves mechanically. Only degeneration and destruction proceed mechanically. That which cannot evolve consciously degenerates. Help from outside is possible only insofar as it is valued and accepted, even if it is only by feeling in the beginning. The language in which understanding is possible is constructed upon the indication of the relation of the object under examination to the evolution possible for it, upon the indication of its place in the evolutionary ladder. For this purpose, many of our usual ideas are divided according to the steps of this evolution. Once again, let us take the idea man. In the language of which I speak, instead of the word man, seven words are used, namely man number one, man number two, man number three, man number four, man number five, man number six, and man number seven. With these seven ideas, people are ready able to understand one another when speaking of man. Man number seven means a man who has reached the full development possible to man and who possesses everything a man can possess, that is, will, consciousness, permanent and unchangeable I, individuality, immortality and many other properties which, in our blindness and ignorance, we ascribe to ourselves. It is only when to a certain extent we understand man number seven and his properties that we can understand the gradual stages through which we can approach him, that is, understand the process of development possible for us. Man number six stands very close to man number seven. He differs from man number seven only by the fact that some of his properties have not as yet become permanent. Man number five is also for us as an unattainable standard of man, for it is a man who has reached unity. Man number four is an intermediate stage. I shall speak of him later. Man number one, number two and number three. These are people who constitute mechanical humanity on the same level on which they are born. Man number one means man in whom the centre of gravity of his psychic life lies in the moving centre. This is the man of the physical body the man with whom the moving and the instinctive functions constantly outweigh the emotional and the thinking functions. Man number two means man on the same level of development, but man in whom the centre of gravity of his psychic life 
lies in the emotional centre, that is, man with whom the emotional functions outweigh all others, the man of feeling, the emotional man. Man number three means man on the same level of development, but man in whom the centre of gravity of his psychic life lies in the intellectual centre, that is, man with whom the thinking functions gain the upper hand over the moving, instinctive and emotional functions, the man of reason who goes into everything from theories, from mental considerations. Every man is born number one, number two or number three. Man number four is not born ready-made. He is born one, two or three and becomes four only as a result of efforts of a definite character. Man number four is always the product of schoolwork. He can neither be born nor develop accidentally or as the result of ordinary influences of bringing up, education and so on. Man number four already stands on a different level to man number one, two and three. He has a permanent centre of gravity which consists in his ideas, in his valuation of the work and in his relation to the school. In addition, his psychic centres have already begun to be balanced. One centre in him cannot have such a preponderance over others as is the case with people of the first three categories. He already begins to know himself and begins to know whither he is going. Man number five has already been crystallised. He cannot change as man number one, two and three change. But it must be noted that man number five can be the result of right work and he can be the result of wrong work. He can become number five from number four and he can become number five without having been number four. And in this case he cannot develop further, cannot become number six and seven. In order to become number six, he must again melt his crystallised essence, must intentionally lose his being of man number five, and this can be achieved only through terrible sufferings. Fortunately, these cases of wrong development occur very rarely. The division of man into seven categories or seven numbers explains thousands of things which otherwise cannot be understood. This division gives the first conception of relativity as applied to man. Things may be one thing or another thing according to the kind of man from whose point of view or in relation to whom they are taken. In accordance with this, all the inner and all the outer manifestations of man, all that belongs to man and all that is created by him, is also divided into seven categories. It can now be said that there exists a knowledge at number one, based upon imitation or upon instincts, or learned by heart, crammed or drilled into a man. Number one, if he is man number one in the full sense of the term, learns everything like a parrot or a monkey. The knowledge of man number two is merely the knowledge of what he likes. What he does not like, he does not know. Always and in everything, he wants something pleasant. Or, if he is a sick man, he will, on the contrary, know only what he dislikes, what repels him, and what evokes in him fear, horror and loathing. The knowledge of man number three is knowledge based upon subjectively, logical thinking, upon words, upon literal understanding. It is the knowledge of bookworms, of scholastics. Men number three, for example, have counted how many times each letter of the Arabic alphabet is repeated in the Quran of Muhammad, and upon this have based a whole system of interpretation of the Quran. The knowledge of man number four is a very different kind of knowledge. It is knowledge which comes from man number five, who in turn receives it from man number six, who has received it from man number seven. But, of course, man number four assimilates of this knowledge only what is possible according to his powers. But in comparison with man number one, man number two and man number three, man number four has begun to get free from the subjective elements in his knowledge and to move along the path towards objective knowledge. The knowledge of man number five is whole, indivisible knowledge. He has now one indivisible I, and all his knowledge belongs to this I. He cannot have one I that knows something which another does not know. What he knows, the whole of him knows. His knowledge is nearer to objective knowledge than the knowledge of man number four. 
The knowledge of man number six is the complete knowledge possible to man, but it can still be lost. The knowledge of man number seven is his own knowledge, which cannot be taken away from him. It is the objective and completely practical knowledge of all. It is exactly the same with being. There is the being of man number one, that is, the being of a man living by his instincts and his sensations. The being of man number two, that is to say, the being of the sentimental, the emotional man. The being of man number three, that is, the being of the rational, the theoretical man, and so on. It is quite clear why knowledge cannot be far away from being. Man number one, two or three cannot, by reason of his being, possess the knowledge of man number four, man number five, and higher. Whatever you may give him, he may interpret it in his own way. He will reduce every idea to the level on which he is himself. The same order of division into seven categories must be applied to everything relating to man. There is art number one, that is the art of man number one. Imitative, copying art or crudely primitive and sensuous art such as the dances and music of savage people. There is art number two, sentimental art, art number three, intellectual, invented art, and there must be art number four, number five, and so on. In exactly the same way, there exists the religion of man number one, that is to say, a religion consisting of rites, of external forms, of sacrifices and ceremonies, of imposing splendour and brilliance, or, on the contrary, of a gloomy, cruel and savage character, and so on. There is the religion of man number two, the religion of faith, love, adoration, impulse, enthusiasm, which soon becomes transformed into the religion of persecution, oppression and extermination of heretics and heathens. There is the religion of man number three, the intellectual, theoretical religion of proofs and arguments based upon logical deductions, considerations and interpretation. Religions number one, number two and number three are really the only ones we know. All known and existing religions and denominations in the world belong to one of these three categories. What the religion of man number four or the religion of man number five and so on is, we do not know and we cannot know so long as we remain what we are. In, instead of religion in general we take Christianity. Then again there exists a Christianity number one, that is to say paganism in the guise of Christianity. Christianity number two is an emotional religion, sometimes very pure but without force, sometimes full of bloodshed and horror leading to the Inquisition, to religious wars. Christianity number three, instances of which are afforded by various forms of Protestantism, is based upon dialectic, argument, theories and so forth. Then there is Christianity number four, of which men number one, number two and number three have no conception whatever. In actual fact, Christianity number one, number two and number three is simply external imitation. Only man number four strives to be a Christian and only man number five can actually be a Christian. For to be a Christian means to have the being of a Christian, that is, to live in accordance with Christ's precepts. Man number one, number two and number three cannot live in accordance with Christ's precepts because with them everything happens. Today it is one thing and tomorrow it is quite another thing. Today they are ready to give away their last shirt and tomorrow to tear a man to pieces because he refuses to give up his shirt to them. They are swayed by every chance event. They are not masters of themselves and therefore they cannot decide to be Christians and really be Christians. Science, philosophy and all manifestation of man's life and activity can be divided in exactly the same way into seven categories. But the ordinary language in which people speak is very far from any such divisions. And this is why it is so difficult for people to understand one another. In analysing the various subjective meaning of the word man, we have seen how varied and contradictory and above all, how concealed and unnoticeable, even to the speaker himself, are the meanings and the shades of meanings created by habitual associations that can be put into a word. Let us take some other word, 
For example, the term world. Each man understands it in his own way, and each man in an entirely different way. Everyone, when he hears or pronounces the word world, has associations entirely foreign and incomprehensible to another. Every conception of the world, every habitual form of thinking, carries with it its own associations, its own ideas. In a man with a religious conception of the world, a Christian, the word world will call up a whole series of religious ideas, will necessarily become connected with the idea of God, with the idea of creation, of the world or the end of the world, or of the sinful world, and so on. For a follower of the Vedantic philosophy, the world before anything else will be illusion, maya. A theosophist will think of the different planes, the physical, the astral, the mental, and so on. A spiritualist will think of the world beyond, the world of spirits. A physicist will look upon the world from the point of view of the structure of matter. It will be a world of molecules or atoms or electrons. For the astronomer, the world will be a world of stars and nebulae, and so on and so on. The phenomenal and the noumenal world, the world of the fourth and other dimensions, the world of good and the world of evil, the material world and the immaterial world, the proportion of power in the different nations of the world, can man be saved in the world, and so on and so on. People have thousands of different ideas about the world, but not one general idea which would enable them to understand one another and to determine at once from what point of view they desire to regard the world. It is impossible to study a system of the universe without studying man. At the same time, it is impossible to study man without studying the universe. Man is an image of the world. He was created by the same laws which created the whole of the world. By knowing and understanding himself, he will know and understand the whole world, all the laws that create and govern the world. And at the same time, by studying the world and the laws that govern the world, he will learn and understand the laws that govern him. In this connection, some laws are understood and assimilated more easily by studying the objective world, while man can only understand other laws by studying himself. The study of the world and the study of man must therefore run parallel, one helping the other. In relation to the term world, it is necessary to understand from the very outset that there are many worlds, and that we live not in one world, but in several worlds. This is not readily understood because in ordinary language the term world is generally used in the singular. And if the plural worlds is used, it is merely to emphasise, as it were, the same idea, or to express the idea of various worlds existing parallel to one another. Our language does not have the idea of worlds contained one within another, and yet the idea that we live in different worlds precisely implies worlds contained one within another, to which we stand in different relations. If we desire an answer to the question, what is the world or worlds in which we live, we must first of all ask ourselves what it is that we may call world in the most intimate and immediate relation to us. To this we may answer that we often give the name of world to the world of people, to humanity in which we live, of which we form part. But humanity forms an inseparable part of organic life on earth. Therefore it would be right to say that the world nearest to us is organic life on earth. The world of plants, animals and men. But organic life is also in the world. What then is world for organic life? To this we can answer that for organic life, our planet, the Earth, is world. But the Earth is also in the world. What then is world for the Earth? World for the Earth is the planetary world of the solar system, of which it forms a part. What is world for all the planets taken together? The sun or the sphere of the sun's influence, or the solar system of which the planets form a part? For the sun, in its turn... World is our world of stars, of the Milky Way, an accumulation of a vast number of solar systems. Furthermore, from an astronomical point of view, it is quite possible to presume a multitude of worlds existing at enormous distances from one another in the space of all worlds. These worlds taken together will be world for the Milky Way. 
Further, passing to philosophical conclusions, we may say that all worlds must form some, for us, incomprehensible and unknown whole or one, as an apple is one. This whole or one or all, which may be called the absolute or the independent because, including everything within itself, it is not dependent upon anything, is world for all worlds. Logically, it is quite possible to think of a state of things where all forms one single whole. Such a whole will certainly be the absolute, which means the independent because it, that is, the all, is infinite and indivisible. The absolute, that is, the state of things when the all constitutes one whole, is, as it were, the primordial state of things, out of which, by division and differentiation, arises the diversity of the phenomena observed by us. Man lives in all these worlds but in different ways. This means that he is first of all influenced by the nearest world, the one immediate to him, of which he forms a part. Worlds further away also influence man, directly as well as through other intermediate worlds, but their action is diminished in proportion to their remoteness or to the increase in the difference between them and man. As will be seen later, the direct influence of the Absolute does not reach man, but the influence of the next world and the influence of the star world are already perfectly clear in the life of man, although they are certainly unknown to science. With this, G ended the lecture. On the next occasion, we had very many questions, chiefly about the influences of the various worlds and why the influence of the Absolute does not reach us. Before examining these influences, began G, and the laws of transformation of unity into plurality, we must examine the fundamental law that creates all phenomena in all the diversity or unity of all universes. This is the law of free, or the law of the free principles, or the free forces. It consists of the fact that every phenomenon, on whatever scale and in whatever world it may take place, from molecular to cosmic phenomena, is the result of the combination or the meeting of three different and opposing forces. Contemporary thought realises the existence of two forces and the necessity of these two forces for the production of a phenomenon, force and resistance, positive and negative magnetism, positive and negative electricity, male and female cells, and so on. But it does not observe even these two forces always and everywhere. No question has ever been raised to the third, or if it has been raised, it has scarcely been heard. According to real exact knowledge, one force or two forces can never produce a phenomenon. The presence of a third force is necessary, for it is only with the help of a third force that the first two can produce what we call a phenomenon, no matter in what sphere. The teaching of the three forces is at the root of all ancient systems. The first force may be called active or positive, the second passive or negative, the third neutralising. But these are merely names, for in reality all three forces are equally active and appear as active, passive and neutralising only at their meeting points, that is to say, only in relation to one another at a given moment. The first two forces are more or less comprehensible to man, and the third may sometimes be discovered either at the point of application of the forces, or in the medium, or in the result. But, speaking in general, the third force is not easily accessible to direct observation and understanding. The reason for this is to be found in the fundamental limitations of man's ordinary psychological activity and in the fundamental categories of our perception of the phenomenal world. That is, in our sense of space and time resulting from these limitations, people cannot perceive and observe the third force directly any more then they can spatially perceive the fourth dimension. But by studying himself, the manifestations of his thought, consciousness, activities, his habits, his desires and so on, man may learn to observe and to see in himself the action of the three forces. Let us suppose, for instance, that a man wants to work in himself in order to change certain of his characteristics, 
to attain a higher level of being. His desire, his initiative, is the active force. The inertia of all his habitual psychological life which shows opposition to his initiative which will be the passive or the negative force. The two forces will either counterbalance one another or one will completely conquer the other, but at the same time it will become too weak for any further action. Thus the two forces will, as it were, revolve one round the other, one absorbing the other and producing no result whatever. This may continue for a lifetime. A man may feel desire and initiative, but all this initiative may be absorbed in overcoming the habitual inertia of life, leaving nothing for the purpose to wills which the initiative ought to be directed. And so it may go on until the third force makes its appearance, in the form, for instance, of new knowledge, showing at once the advantage or the necessity of work on oneself and, in this way, supporting and strengthening the initiative. Then the initiative, with the support of this third force, may conquer inertia and the man becomes active in the desired direction. Examples of the action of the three forces and the moments of entry of the third force may be discovered in all manifestations of our psychic life, in all phenomena of the life of human communities and of humanity as a whole and in all the phenomena of nature around us. But at the beginning it is enough to understand the general principle. Every phenomenon, of whatever magnitude it may be, is inevitably the manifestation of three forces. One or two forces cannot produce a phenomenon, and if we observe a stoppage in anything, or an endless hesitation at the same place, we can say that, at the given place, the third force is lacking. In trying to understand this, it must be remembered at the same time that people cannot observe phenomena as manifestations of free forces because we cannot observe the objective world in our subjective states of consciousness. And in the subjectively observed phenomenal world, we see in phenomena only the manifestation of one or two forces. If we could see the manifestation of free forces in every action, we should then see the world as it is, things in themselves. Only it must here be remembered that a phenomenon which appears to be simple may actually be very complicated. That is, it may be a very complex combination of trinities. But we know that we cannot observe the world as it is, and this should help us to understand why we cannot see the third force. The third force is a property of the real world. The subjective or phenomenal world of our observation is only relative real. At any rate, it is not complete. Returning to the world in which we live, we may now say that in the absolute, as well as in everything else, three forces are active, the active, the passive and the neutralising. But since by its very nature everything in the absolute constitutes one whole, the three forces also constitute one whole. Moreover, in forming one independent whole, the three forces possess a full and independent will, full consciousness, full understanding of themselves and of everything they do. The idea of the unity of the three forces in the absolute forms the basis of many ancient teachings. Consubstantial and indivisible trinity, Trimurti, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva and so on. The three forces of the absolute constitute in one whole, separate and unite by their own will and by their own decision, and at the points of junction they create phenomena or worlds. These worlds, created by the will of the Absolute, depend entirely upon this will and everything that concerns their own existence. In each of these worlds, the three forces again act. Since, however, each of these worlds is now not the whole, but only a part, then the three forces in them do not form a single whole. It is now a case of free wills, free consciousnesses, free unities. Each of the three forces contains within it the possibility of all three forces, but at the meeting point of the three forces, each of them manifests only one principle, the active, the passive, or the neutralizing. The three forces together form a trinity which produces new phenomena, but this trinity is different. It is not that which was in the absolute, 
where the three forces formed an indivisible whole and possessed one single will and one single consciousness. In the worlds of the second order, the three forces are now divided and their meeting points are now of a different nature. In the absolute, the moment and the point of their meeting is determined by their single will. In the worlds of the second order, where there is no longer a single will but free wills, the points of issue are each determined by a separate will, independent of the others, and therefore the meeting point becomes accidental or mechanical. The will of the absolute creates the worlds of the second order and governs them, but it does not govern their creative work in which a mechanical element makes its appearance. Let us imagine the absolute as a circle, and in it a number of upper circles, worlds of the second order. Let us take one of these circles. The absolute is designated by the number one, because the three forces constitute one whole in the absolute, and the small circles we will designate by the number three, because in a world of the second order, the three forces are already divided. The three divided forces in the worlds of the second order meeting together in each of these worlds, create new worlds of the third order. Let us take one of these worlds. The worlds of the third order, created by the three forces which act semi-mechanically, no longer depend upon the single will of the absolute, but upon three mechanical laws. These worlds are created by the three forces, and having been created they manifest three new forces of their own. Thus the number of forces acting in the worlds third order will be six. In the diagram the circle of the third order is designated by the number six, three plus three. In these worlds are created worlds of a new order, the fourth order. In the worlds of the fourth order there act three forces of this world of the second order, six forces of the world of the third order and three of their own, twelve forces altogether. Let us take one of these worlds and designate it by the number 12, 3 plus 6 plus 3. Being subject to a greater number of laws, these worlds stand still further away from the single will of the absolute and are still more mechanical. The worlds created within these worlds will be governed by 24 forces, 3 plus 6 plus 12 plus 3. The worlds created within these worlds will be governed by 48 forces, the number 48 being made up as follows. Three forces of the world immediately following the absolute, six of the next one, twelve of the next one, twenty-four of the one after, and three of its own. Three plus six plus twelve plus twenty-four plus three. Forty-eight in all. Worlds created within worlds 48 will be governed by 96 forces. Three plus six plus twelve plus twenty-four plus forty-eight plus three. The worlds of the next order, if there are any, will be governed by 192 forces, and so on. If we take one of the many worlds created in the absolute, that is world 3, it will be the world representing the total number of starry worlds similar to our Milky Way. If we take world 6, it will be one of the worlds created within this world, namely the accumulation of stars which we call the Milky Way. World 12 will be one of the suns that are composed the Milky Way, our sun. World 24 will be the planetary world, that is to say, all the planets of the solar system. World 48 will be the Earth. World 96 will be the moon. If the moon had a satellite, it would be 192, and so on. The chain of worlds, the links of which are the absolute, all worlds, all suns, our sun, the planets, the earth and the moon, forms the ray of creation in which we find ourselves. The ray of creation is for us the world in the widest sense of the term. Of course, the ray of creation does not include the world in the full sense of the term, since the absolute gives birth to a number, perhaps to an infinite number, of different worlds, each of which begins a new and separate ray of creation. Furthermore, each of these worlds contains a number of worlds representing a further breaking up of the ray, and again of these worlds we select only one, our Milky Way. The Milky Way consists of a number of suns, but of this number we select one sun which is nearest to us, upon which we immediately depend, and in which we live and move and have our being. Each of the other suns means a new breaking up of the ray, 
but we cannot study these rays in the same way as our ray, that is, the ray in which we are situated. Further, within the solar system, the planetary world is nearer to us than the sun itself, and within the planetary world, the nearest of all to us is the Earth, the planet on which we live. We have no need to study other planets in the same way as they study the Earth. It is sufficient for us to take them all together, that is to say, on a considerably smaller scale than we take the Earth. The number of forces in each world, 1, 3, 6, 12 and so on, indicates the number of laws to which the given world is subject. The fewer laws there are in a given world, the nearer it is to the will of the Absolute. The more laws there are in a given world, the greater the mechanicalness, the further it is from the will of the Absolute. We live in a world subject to 48 orders of law, that is to say, very far from the will of the Absolute, and in a very remote and dark corner of the universe. In this way, the ray of creation helps us to determine and to realise our place in the world. But, as you see, we have not yet come to questions about influences. In order to understand the difference between the influences of various worlds, we must better understand the law of three, and then, further still, another fundamental law, the law of seven, or the law of octaves.